up with. Um, this quarter, we decided to focus on peds, the thing that scares the living shit out of all of us, um, except for the peds folks. So I reached out to uh, our peds team here. Um, so we got Phil and Pooja from, uh, from our peds team. Um, and I will, uh, they're going to be taking the lead. Uh, I will kind of throw my two cents in. I'll be the one monitoring the, uh, the chat box for whatever questions. Uh, but uh, without further ado, uh, go for it, uh, Phil. Yep. Hi, guys. I'm Phil. I'm the nurse manager of the pediatric program here at Hopkins. And I also have Pooja with me. Hi. Uh, and my medical director, Karina Noje, is on. Karina, are you on? Yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting us. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here in, in this forum. Hopefully, we'll all have a good time and, um, and learn about the interesting peace okay. cases. I'll mute myself, though. OK. Is that how we're going to have to do it, please? I think so. All right. So I'm expecting audience participation. I'm only here to. Uh, have some discussion, but I really want to hear from you guys. So the first case is hey, Phil. stress. Yep. I'm going to interject real fast. Let's uh, let everybody know who's here from the panel. So um, uh, Karina, I think we got you. We know who you are. You're the, the medical director for the PEDS team uh, over here at Hopkins. Uh, looks like we got Dr. Lawner. Um, and uh, we got Dr. Margolis, who's the medical director over here. Um, Dr. Lawner is the medical director uh, over at MEC. Looks like we got Ruben, uh, who's one of our associate medical directors over here. And then uh, Dr. Hack, who's our EMS fellow. Did I miss any of the our panel folks, our docs? Looks like I got everybody. OK, sorry, Phil. Go for okay, it. No, no worries. All right, so your first case is respiratory distress. And you get a page while you're eating lunch for a one-year-old with an acute episode of choking, coughing up blood, retracting with strider, and the referring hospital is 112 miles away. All right, guys, it's your turn to let me know what your thoughts are. What's your pre-dispatch huddle discussion points? What are you worried about? What's on your differential with just this much information? Why isn't the PEDS team going for this? <laughs> We're out. We're, well, Is I'm there sorry, a closer hospital? Yeah. <laughs> Can we turn this to someone else? <laughs> Is there a fixed wing transport option available? They're no. down for weather. They're down for weather. No. Um, all right. So, what are your thoughts? What's on your differential when you hear about a one year old with an acute episode of choking? And then I'll give you some more of the case presentation, but just right off your top of your head. What do they choke on? Is a foreign body still present? Awesome, you know, foreign body, top of my list. What about yours, Pooja? Yeah, one other thing I'm thinking of when I think of choking kids that usually they're vaccinated for, but a very rare finding that you should always have on your differential with kids. Whooping cough or something like that. Or epiglottitis. Is epiglottitis. Yeah. yeah, which we actually don't see anymore, but I'm old enough to have seen it. Well, I'm gonna correct you, Phil. We have seen it three Most years ago. <laughs> and you do ago. have the pictures of the, <laughs> the, the ENT pictures. So it's still there. It's not really caused by H flu the way it used to be, um, but it's still it's still there. So it, it should still be uh, appropriately scaring everybody as it does um, us <laughs> on the peat side. Yep. All right. So then what do you think your mode of transportation would be? Would you go by ground? Would you go by rotor? Would you not go at all? Not an option. Not an option. I, I think the objective is to do what you can to decrease out of hospital time, right? Okay. This is a very tenuous situation. This can obviously decompensate quickly. Whatever needs to be done to decrease out of hospital time, I think, is the objective. Yep. Uh, clearly, so having the patient stay there is really not an option because, generally speaking, they've exceeded their ability to take care of the patient, which is why they're calling for additional assistance. Yep, so you wanna get there as fast as you can. So the fastest mode we have is With by air. air. Which is exactly and, what Yeah, and, and I mean, I think that for PEDS, that's really one of the tricky parts for us because um, there are obviously a lot of uh, institutions that have, uh, um, you know, mm -hmm. variable degree of, um, 
um, comfort with uh, adult emergencies. When it comes to pediatric emergencies, um, you can probably just, you know, there are only three institutions in the state um, that can manage um, pediatric emergencies um, um, at, at the level that uh, would require, you know, tertiary care or quaternary care. Um, so pretty much everybody um, else would be calling uh, one of these two or three places. And so I yeah. went to Karina and Asa's thought that sometimes with pediatrics, it's not a matter of getting the child out of the facility as quickly as possible, but getting the pediatric specialty resources to the to, child, to, yeah, exactly. which is what, what we wanted to do in this particular case. All right, I'm gonna give you a little more information about the case now that you've got yourself in the aircraft. So the parents were called by the daycare that the child had a choking episode and coughed up some blood. The parents brought the child to the primary care provider where he was found to be febrile at 39.6. There was a small laceration noted in his mouth, but he ultimately was sent home with his parents. Um, and during a nap, the dad heard him gurgling and brought him to this uh, hospital. That was 112, 118 miles away. I'm not even gonna tell you what the, who the hospital is. So upon presentation at that hospital, his temp was 39.6. He was tachycardic to 182. He was breathing 28 times per minute and his sats were 89 on room air. Uh, and they didn't obtain a blood pressure, not because they couldn't, but just because they didn't have the appropriate size cuff, which we see often in pediatrics. He was warm and well perfused with good cap refill. He was retracting with some strider. He preferred to sit up. Uh, he was becoming lethargic. You can see his lab work there and his lateral neck films were pending and his chest x-ray was clear. And they had given some IV steroids and some epi. So now that you have a patient assessment, is there anything else that's going through your mind in terms of um, your differentials? They pretty much would remain the same. Anybody wanna add anything to their differential? He's now febrile. What about this? Is, yeah. And what about this assessment makes you worry? Okay. Can I have a couple comments on that? Or are we worried at this point? I mean, it's fine if you're not worried. There's a lot to worry about here. Well, go ahead. I mean, we just go down the list of things to worry about. Um, you know, hypoxic, tachypnic, leaning forward, sitting up, gurgling. It's probably drooling somewhere in there. Um, these, these, these are all, these are all bad things. Um, the small laceration in the mouth is interesting. I, I wonder if that's sort of a, a red herring, like maybe something was bothering the kid and he stuck his own finger in there to figure out what was going on and cut himself. Uh, maybe this has nothing to do with trauma. You know, maybe this was an infectious etiology from the get-go, um, as evidenced by the fever or, or maybe, you know, or maybe not, but I, you know, I, don't know if I would necessarily anchor on the fact that uh, the laceration necessarily means that, you know, he had some trauma sort of precipitating this event. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think you're smack on too. I think, you know, for me as a provider in pediatrics for all my life, just about, the, that the fact that he wants to sit up is synonymous with tripoding to me. Like he's sitting up. The fact that he's lethargic could mean that he's hypercarbic um, and he's actually not not only hypoxic, but that it could be having some element of um, and I will add hypoventilation. For me too, the fact that they've given a steroid and racemic and his exam continues to get worse is what a red flag for me as well, in addition to all the other things. Yeah, so I, I agree people that are with saying the lethargy is concerning as well. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, that's a biggie for me too. Go ahead, Karina, what were you going to add? And then yeah, I mean, I think I, I fully agree with the group. The, the description of all the scary uh, factors here is uh, spot on. Um, and then I, I do want to uh, point out to the group that for pediatrics, um, Strider, um, Strider is a big deal. Um, and essentially, you're immediately worrying about upper airway obstruction. And upper airway obstruction in pediatric um, is synonymous um, in, in the minds of people who think of the worst things first. Um, to a difficult airway. So we train our transport team to link the two um, together very quickly 
um, and then uh, utilize um, um, these sort of action, action link phrases of, oh, the patient um, um, has strider alongside with all the other things that were described. Therefore, I am concerned about potential upper airway obstruction. Um, therefore, um, I'm concerned that this could be a potential difficult airway. So we teach the folks to, to label it this way um, because the mental model changes significantly. Um, so it's just a, you know, just a point to in agreement with the, with the, with the group. Yeah, just be uh, mindful of your baseline too. You know, there's, everybody's kind of said this, but um, sometimes pediatrics can be, it, it can make people a little bit more uh, contemplative as it should. But I think the, uh, in this case, it illustrates as Aza pointed out that, you know, once you're deviated from baseline and you have signs of respiratory distress and failure of protective airway reflexes, I think that puts you um, in an extremely different kind of synthesis, especially for the transport. So um, in this case, knowing your baseline and, and knowing key factors of assessment, I think is quite helpful. So pretty alarming with the tachypnea and the work of breathing as well. Yeah, awesome, great point. So when our transport team arrived, their assessment was, was pretty similar that as reported, he was tachycardic. They had put him on six liters high flow and 100% and he remained hypoxic at 82% saturated. He had a significant amount of drooling, um, no strider, but he was retracting, warm and well perfused. He was lying on mom's chest um, and he was alert, but he was tired appearing. And when we hear an outside hospital say that he's that they're getting tired, we get nervous. All right, so I'm gonna show you this and see if anybody has anything to offer. I'll, I'm gonna go through it, show it twice. Oops, what happened, Pooja? Go back, hold on guys, go back. We'll show it one more time. Anybody more or less worried? Or? Yeah, so now what are your thoughts? That's what you walk into. I'd like to restate my concern of why the PEDS team didn't go for this kid. <laughs> so what are you gonna uh, do? You gonna call 911? <laughs> We've actually threatened to do that a couple of times when we walk in, we're like, oh, no, we're not doing this. No, but on a serious note, what, what do you want to do with that? You want to secure the airway? You want to not secure the airway? You want to scoop and run? You want to stay and play? You want to go by ground? Let mommy sit in the back? What do you guys want to do? Y'all feel free to unmute yourself and uh, throw your comments out there. This reaction was exactly our reaction. I'm gonna say it was like an "Oh my God, what do we do now?" But um, feel free to to make some comments. Like literally, what would you do in this scenario, knowing that obviously everybody knows there are no good options. And it's about a thirty to thirty-five minute flight time, and about a two and a half to three hour ground time. I mean, for I me, I think the airway needs secured. Yeah, I, I would be uncomfortable rolling the dice and saying, well, I I think we're going to be okay, or I hope we're going to be okay, or we could just drive faster. Um, because when it goes downhill, it's a lot more difficult to do that in the back of the helicopter and an ambulance. Um, securing this kid's airway is going to be quite difficult. Um, okay. But I think doing it in a more stable environment um, is probably better than praying that you won't have to do it in a less stable one. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you who's going to do the intubation, where, and what agents you're going to use, and what's your backup plan? Yeah, you want me to, I, I can keep going. Anybody else want to join in? <laughs> like, I feel like I'm, I, I just, I'm just <laughs> here to make discussion, but yeah, I, I mean, go ahead. <laughs> Long leash, Asa. I, I'm gonna actually. I'm gonna. I'm gonna put Ruben and or Kate on 
on the hook on this one because you guys work sometimes sure. in a remote place. Like, not you're not always working at Hopkins. Like, this happens but, but, at Howard, or this happens um, over at Bayview, where you don't have peds and maybe all the resources. And you can also yeah, comment. Absolutely. You can I also think. comment a little bit on like what would various options be depending on what various resources would be available at the different facilities that would yeah. um, refer pediatric cases, uh, which I think you know is a fair assumption that not all of not not every hospital is the same. You know, not every non-pediatric specific hospital is the same. So you can no. make some comments. No, Phil and Pooja, sorry, is there? Is there a fellow here? Is there a physician here? That, yeah, that so also we did, obviously we did bring our fellow. Yep, because when we, you know, uh, from the get-go, we were, we were worried about this child's airway, so we boarded uh, a fellow. In what year is the fellow, and when did this occur? Like, what month of the year? Uh, uh, it was like, it was springtime. Yeah, like spring. I want to say spring. Yeah. And, and believe me, Karina and I both got called on this one, and we... Yeah. We, I, I had a three, I had a two months so old, six week old. So it must have been at the time I remember because I was trying to walk her um, and, and that was a disaster. Um, so probably just about, yeah, it, it was like uh, early April. Yeah. And the fellows won't matter. We, we, so our practice is we um, don't put fellows on um, transports for the first six months of their um um, of their training, uh, and that sort of goes along with the um, with the practice, um, the informal sort of practice across the country in terms of other pediatric um, um, facilities that send uh, pediatric critical care fellows and PEM fellows out, and or PEM fellows out. But other than that, it could be you know a person in his ninth month of fellowship. It could be somebody that is a combined pediatric um, ICU anesthesia fellow who's been doing this for six years and is still called a mm -hmm. fellow. It could be somebody, so it's, it's a wide sort of range of, um, of options here, but you have a critical care, pediatric critical care fellow um, with you, whether that makes any difference or not in this scenario. Are they trained in fiber optic intubation? Some of the like the anesthesia critically. No, they're not. No, Phil says. Okay. So Sorry, all their, we're Go training. Ahead. So ASA, the, the, the excellent question. So we're training them. So th so they do um, you know just regular DLs. Um, they can do video assisted ones too these days. Um, they have gone through a difficult airway course, uh, which may mean something or not. Um, and they have uh, practice with um, needle crikes um, and using jet ventilation. Um, and and that, that's sort of something that the whole team um, has practice with. But again, these are scenarios that um, um, are very rare, um, <laughs> as everybody knows. So a difficult, air, um, a difficult airway anticipated or unanticipated in pediatrics is a, is a very rare scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, so therefore, the, the hands-on experience is extremely um, dilute. Um, so all these people, you can safely assume that nobody has actually done it on a real patient. Yeah. It's a safe assumption. Well, we can- I'm gonna so, go on mute. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm gonna follow Ace on mute too, because this is really important to engage everybody in the critical decision-making. I think that, uh, you know, it, it, we always talk about this in sim training is that you gotta be mindful of the tools in the toolbox. And here you can bring, a six-year fellow attending, you can bring whoever you want to bring. But the challenge is, if you've got lower airway pathology in a critically ill pediatric patient, I would respectfully suggest this is not the time to start thinking about fiber optic intubation and transport. Um, for epiglottitis and known issues, fiber optic is great. But I would venture, I mean, we have senior airway labs and we do this all the time. But um, as has been said in the crowd, I think deploying fiber optic as a means of rescue in a known difficult airway situation can be really tricky if you don't have all the resources you need. So when you're thinking about how to um, mitigate this airway, sometimes it also helps to go with what you know. And I, I think here's, we do have some literature, meaning that if let's say we decided to go ahead and take this airway, um, whether it be good or not, uh, direct laryngoscopy or video laryngoscopy would be probably the best means possible to ensure adequate success. And I'm only mentioning that because unless you have to tell your airway plan to the resources around you and fiber optics, even with adults that are well-trained 
um, and even our anesthesiology colleagues, you're talking about like a 75% success rate. So just to throw more crap into the burning shit spark, that's this airway. <laughs> yeah, Ben, what would be your first choice? Like, like state up, you know, state them out. Like you're, if you had all the tools in all the boxes, all the people, everything you wanted, how would you want this to be done? And then what's your second best and third best? And if nothing else, what's your last choice? So if, you know, and I tried to get on mute for this, but if you have, so if you have, let's say an impending pediatric airway failure with the possibility of some bad structures or architecture, um, Bowman had mentioned OR fiber optics, because that's where you have all your backup. Uh, I think that would be number one. If you don't have that support and you're at a place where somebody is failing, I agree, you can't shut <laughs> the helicopter. So DL, because it's somewhat familiar, or VL would be number two, and then you deal with your backups. The challenge with this case is if you deploy a super glottic, you may get yourself into trouble because um, you may be kind of uh, above the obstruction or above the pathology. You might not be able to oxygenate. Um, and then obviously the age, um, your last, the last resort would be uh, some type of needle cricothyroidotomy. Yeah. Yeah, this is really tricky. I, I agree, Ben. This is just one of those situations where um, they are, the best option for this kid is for him to be in a pediatric tertiary or coronary care facility that has a pediatric and experienced pediatric ENT, experienced pediatric anesthesiologist, a pediatric OR, and a pediatric ECMO on standby in case you actually can't get it at all, which we, you know, it has happened in the past. So other than sort of this scenario, nothing else um, is gonna make me happy. Um, and, and we are in the nothing else sort of category here. Um, so I think that then you're sort of starting to go down the algorithm of if we don't have these things, because obviously we don't, then what can we do? Can we bring these things to the patient um, or can we, um, can we settle for less? And where does the risk benefit ratios uh, end up um, if we have to settle for less? Um, so I think that that's probably one of the discussions that people want to have, knowing that this is not just one team's responsibility. Um, this, is, this became a, um, a, a mutual sort of medical legal responsibility. Um, yes, the patient is still in the referring institution's um, ER, um, but um, we are also there. So um, the medical legal responsibility is very much shared. So whatever decision is being made, it has to be a decision that everybody is able to buy into. And, and we did discuss, you know, like Karita said, the best place for his airway to be secured would be at Hopkins where we had ECMO backup and, and whatnot. And we did discuss if we chose not to secure the airway at this outside hospital because we didn't believe the resources were there for us, then you know, would we bring him back in this condition? And should he deteriorate, he would get criked. We would do CPR and crash him on ECMO. We discussed all that. Uh, but I don't want to derail anybody's comments with that. Um, so it sounds like everybody has agreed that we should go to the OR at the outside hospital. Can I make one more comment, Phil? And I think yeah. that it's a valid one because these scenarios occur with a very rare frequency. And we've looked them up. And for us, I want to say it's 0.1% of all of our calls, which is very little, right? Um, and we do only pediatrics and we have a very large volume. So it's, it's so they're rare and they're rare across the country as everybody knows. Um, so again, when we're talking about expertise, where is the expertise located? Um, obviously the expertise is, is um, um, uh, located and sort of at, at tertiary coronary care pedi pediatric centers. And then, so then we sort of started to look backwards and say to our, this was a big, um, discussion with our pediatric ENT colleagues um, who are fabulous and there are a lot of them and, um, and they have all these fancy tools. So we said, why can't we pick you up and take you there? Because obviously uh, in for select cases. 
And they made a really good point to us, which for me was interesting, um, saying a man is nothing without his tools. Well, that's, you know, interesting to say um, in the sense of um, we expertise and us are great, but essentially it's our tools that we want. And that's why they're not secure. They're not running around into hospital securing airways in like remote places. They're bringing kids to the OR. And so they do this for a reason because they have all their equipment that cannot be easily transported. So that made, so that they offered to help us through video telemedicine, through, you know, help us, um, you know, essentially navigate um, an airway, knowing that at all times a bad airway is better than no airway. And that is where the risk versus benefit discussion ends up. Like you have a bad airway now and um, it's rolling the dice. You decide to induce um, the induction piece is a whole totally different story. Um, and then you can get the airway or you can't. And then if you can't, you'll have no airway. So then what do you do then? And um, so their mantra is always a bad airway is better than no airway. And they're happy to get on telemedicine with us. And they have done that. And they're happy to direct to, to admit patients to the OR um, directly for transport, which we are also doing and on more than one occasion. Um, but they can't and they will not board an aircraft without their tools um, to be able to, to because they, they don't believe that they can rescue anybody this way. And I think that that's an interesting sort of assumption, um, but, uh, but nonetheless, it is what it is. So the option of bringing friends is not there. So then you're gonna have to decide whether to do it there and then, the, and then deal with it sort of locally. So who will do it, where will it be done? And asking what resources the, the facility would have. Do you have a pediatric anything? The answer is no. Uh, do you have an adult anything? And then we're asking what adult anything do you wanna have? Adult anesthesiologist, adult ENT, adult surgeon, you know, somebody that would be able to give you some help if you end up down the lower parts of the difficult airway pediatric algorithm. So I'm just gonna stop the record probably talk for a long time about this case. So my question to <clears throat> all the medical directors that are on the adult side medical directors, um, if I'm in this situation and the answers to all of her questions are, are no, there's no anesthesia in house, I'm at some place like Chester River, where there's no resources. Um, how do you want me? How do you want me to proceed with this? Is this DL VL? Like, do you want me to just pray and fly fast? Like, is is it worth instrumenting this airway? Not instrumenting this airway? Kind of figuring out what's going on. Is it worth driving the kid to a closer facility? Yeah, that's a good question too. I mean, we, we actually did, we Googled, you know, is AI DuPont Daddy closer? Uh, because they're obviously a hospital of our caliber and it didn't, it didn't get us anything. No. It, it tied wise. Yeah. It was you know, the same. So we, we did over, you know, we discussed all that. But yeah, so I'll, I'll let the so, medical directors have a Kate, stab. Kate, I call you with this. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Thanks, Sam. I, I, I throw my phone on the floor and run away. Uh, yeah. No. So, uh, I, I mean, I guess I would sort of say, All right, well, well, who's there? Who do we have there at all? And, you know, if there's a, a willing anesthesiologist, there's probably not ENT at a hospital of that size, um, but you might have anesthesia there and talking with the emergency physician who's sending the patient. Uh, maybe have a conversation with anesthesia, maybe general surgery, and have everyone involved to come up with a plan to kind of secure this airway in the most controlled fashion possible. If that's like, you know, first attempt by the anesthesiologist uh, with, you know, backup plan in place for maybe fiber optic if you're not going to be successful using this, the routine that you would use most often. And, uh, but I think calling all your friends in and sort of getting as many you know, uh, experienced and resourced 
people there as possible um, is is probably the way to go. I, I understand like the ENT, you know, this is a bad a bad airway is better than no airway. But the problem is like once you're in the back of your vehicle, you you could still with that bad airway end up with no airway, and now you really can't do anything at all. And so I would probably err on the side of Yes, it's less than ideal. Yes, you don't have all your pediatric resources there, but um, you know, at that point, trying to do it in an OR in a more controlled setting is probably going to give you your best chance of success. Any, anybody else? I'm, ben, I'm, Asa, Ruben, thoughts? Let me just. So here's the other thing, and, and obviously this is a this is a crappy place to be. We can all spend time figuring out, you know, what we would do, and I think unfortunately the the answer is gonna be, right, some type of suboptimal plan. But I would just say this about resources, and we've seen this countless times with our you know, generalist approach, and, and people say that was such disdain, right? So we're a generalist team, let's get all the resources. How many times, how many times do we go to these outside hospitals, and if you abdicate your airway plan to people that, so if this anesthesiologist, it's 4.30 and he hasn't finished his Sudoku, and the, the airway plan is an absolute disaster, meaning that we have those experiences, right, where we are at outside facilities and you bring people in who have no experience and that's kind of well documented. So I would just add the caveat that when we talk about resources, especially in terms of bringing everybody in, it's very important to articulate the plan because sometimes more does not equal better, especially if patients aren't coordinated and on board. So um, I think this is one of those where we, we may also consider temporizing. I mean, there are crash airways that occur in the helicopter. They're not favorable. But if you can temporize the kid with, let's say, some high flow and some resuscitation, that may be an option. I think, obviously, if the kid requires active airway assistance, you'd probably have to do VL with your most experienced provider and make sure everybody is on board with the plan before you do any everything. Because as we've seen, and Kate alludes to this, right, we need help. But sometimes help that's not coordinated is worse than um, no help at all. Um, Dr. Lauder, I, 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 uh, I, I totally agree. And, and I think like I, as this case was unfolding, I was thinking about like, uh, you know, other similar sort of airway disaster cases we'll see in some community hospitals are like bad angioedema or anaphylaxis cases, right? And, you know, ideally there you'd want to have as many experienced airway operators uh, there as possible. Um, and when you have some time, this kid's been sitting this way at least for a few hours, presumably before your team even shows up. Um, optimizing and sort of vocalizing your plan as distinctly as possible and getting around board hopes to kind of minimize the chaos that happens once things start to not go the way you initially expected, right? And sort of talking about, yeah, and, and Dr. Guy, that's a great point, including the, the parents in this as well, um, to kind of, you know, uh, do a little expectation management um, as, uh, as things start to unfold, I think is also very important. But um, yeah, coming with a plan beforehand while you have a little bit of time and getting everything set up and optimized so that you can try and, you know, minimize your chance of a poor outcome as much as possible. Okay. So that's basically what we did. So we uh, had a collaborative discussion at the bedside. Uh, it was agreed upon that the airway needed to be secured. The referring hospital's adult ENT was uncomfortable. So he opted out. The referring hospital's anesthesiology was willing to take the child to the OR for intubation. And as a backup, the adult surgical team was in the operating room for a possible trach should they not be able to secure the airway. So in the OR, the first attempt, the epiglottis was extremely swollen. The patient developed bradycardia to the 30s, lost his sat for a few seconds, but then was successfully bagged up. And on second attempt, they visualized a foreign body, which was a piece of plastic with a sharp edge that they were able to remove. And they were able to get a 3.5 ET tube in. So then our work started began, <laughs> began after that. <laughs> and so we started the child on a fentanyl drip. Um, the child became pale with worsening cap refill. Now it was three to five seconds, despite having 750 mLs of saline with the child's eight kilos. The anesthesia was bagging the child. He was coughing and wasn't in sync with the BVM. They used 
fentanyl and ketamine for induction only. They did not give a paralytic and there's can be a ton of discussion around that, which is for another day. Um, so we ended up paralyzing it with rock and we just could not get him transitioned to the ventilator because we were just having poor chest rise and inability to ventilate. Uh, so we bagged him and then he developed bronchospasm. And so we started going down that algorithm of treating him with albuterol NEBS. And we actually had to manually exhale for him, um, which was kind of get, getting everybody, like nobody understood why, right? You know, like, could this child, because he was febrile, have a concurrent viral illness on top of this? You know, what happened during the intubation that made him de-recruit? Like we just weren't sure, uh, but we decided instead of putting him on the ventilator that we would bag him and manually exhale him in route. Uh, I'll disclose the hospital, this was PRMC. It is sometimes depending on uh, headwinds, it could be up to a 35 minute flight. So kind of a long time. Uh, his end titles remained in the 50s during flight. So when he got here, he we didn't take him to the OR right away. We just sort of let him settle out. But this is um, a picture of his post-transport um, OR scope. So, yep. And you can see in the image to the right, what, that's exactly where this little piece of plastic was. And on the next slide, I'll show you what they were at, what they fished out at the outside hospital. And there it is. Thoughts? He was discharged home, I think, on day three. Yeah. Day why not four. paralyze the kid with our, like, why not paralyze him during the airway management? Karina? That, that's that. So this could go on oh, for an sorry. hour. Okay, <laughs> I was hoping I'll we could limit, get to the I'll, second. I was hoping this, we could get but... to the second case, friends. It's interesting as well. Um, oh. But yeah, so I think that the reason why oh, we I'm going to give this, you ten minutes. <laughs> I'm going to stop sooner than that. But um, the point here, and, and it's sort of linked to what I had mentioned in the beginning, is that whenever we have suspicion for upper airway obstruction, we always sort of link it with a the phrase. Therefore, I'm. I'm very concerned that the patient may have a difficult airway so that the entire group um, now has a different mental model of a patient with a pediatric difficult airway. Whether you know the algorithm by heart or not, you can pull it up. Um, um, it will sort of trigger folks to um, think twice about inducing a patient, think twice about securing the airway, come up with backup plans, um, you know, have your, um, um, you know, needle crike um, uh, set up, um, you know, right there, you know, available as you're um, trying to do your first DL or VL. Um, and as part of, part, part, part of this entire exercise is to go over sort of what, um, what induction agents would you want to choose? And that's a little bit tricky because um, um, obviously, the difficult airway algorithms um, fall into sort of two kind of categories, the ones where you are able to mask and the ones that you are unable to mask. And you will not find out the outcome or which side of it you are until you've induced. So if you're able to mask and you have time, it's not too bad. If you're unable to mask, it becomes problematic very quickly. Um, so one of the parts of, of the difficult airway algorithm is talking about waking up the, you know, the patient and aborting the procedure if you can. Well, obviously you can't wake him up if you paralyze him unless you have an agent that will um, sort of immediately, um, it, whether you use socks and we don't use socks in little boys. This was a little boy, was a one-year-old. You don't know whether um, you know, he doesn't have a concurrent myopathy or something like that. So socks would be out of the question. Um, the other agents, um, um, the reversals would take longer. So generally speaking, um, we do not, um, we, may, we may have a paralytic available and drawn up and we could decide to use it if after we induce and sedate the patient, we're able to uh, back mass ventilate. 
if we're unable to back mass ventilate, then we will, thank God we didn't paralyze. Um, and if we are, then we're gonna still try to secure the airway without it, unless we're unable to. And then we will have the medicine available. Um, but generally speaking, we would try, we, we would choose agents that will maintain the patient spontaneously breathing. Um, so those would typically be um, ketamine. Um, sometimes if the patient is really, really altered um, and hypercarbic and don't need a lot, a little bit of dex, sometimes you could go, you could get away with a little bit of propofol, titrated just such. But generally speaking, the best choice here is going to be your ketamine. I think that once you add fentanyl to the mix, it's a little bit, a little bit of a different discussion. Um, um, of course, the one problem with ketamine would be secretions, in which case, in a difficult airway, it would be tricky. If you add secretions, that would cloud your view. Um, but nonetheless, of all the sort of the in, in, inappropriate and less than ideal agents, um, uh, 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 titration of ketamine uh, for induction would be what most um, uh, prudent pediatric um, uh, folks would use and then have your paralytic available already drawn up in case you are able to ventilate, um, a bag, bag mass ventilate, but for some reason you need to give it as you're securing the airway. It's, it's tricky. Most of us would not, um, and, and the algorithm does not support that you paralyze these patients because you can be up a creek without a paddle fairly quickly and have no ability to recover. Um, so for patients, for difficult airway algorithms that we send our, our people to, and we do this exercise, we haven't had to use it in, in many years, but we do this exercise for every foreign body in the truck or you know, people are like discussing what the airway plan would be, are drawing up their meds, they um, pull the difficult airway kit, they set up their uh, cryic um, kit, they get the pediatric McGills and put them in their pocket, literally walk with them in the pocket because you don't, once you need them and you're in a crisis, you can't find anything. Um, so they sort of walk in that way and they don't have to use it, which is great. Um, but if need be, um, you know, they have the ability. So it's a long discussion, but bottom line is that um, that's sort of the reason why we purposefully um, do not um, muscle relax children with difficult airways. And I just want to add, of course, this last little slide is a smiley little baby that got discharged. Uh, but this could have gone, our decision to take him to the OR could have gone equally as bad. And um, we were just fortunate that we were able to have a good outcome. But that's not always the case. And that weighed a lot into the decision-making process, because obviously everybody was, you know, we were all heroes at the end, but this could have turned out very badly. And we would have been on the ENT side of the story of a bad airway is better than no airway, but which is why it's very important that whatever decision we make is a really a collaborative decision that everybody buys into. Um, and this was a pro protracted um, uh, transport. Our transport times are relatively short, but this one was ours at the, you know, in the OR negotiating, um, then agreeing, then going to the OR, then, you know, our fellow help. Um, it was, and then, you, you know, if you started to talk so about the medical there. legal responsibilities, then it becomes an even bigger sort of, you know, mess um, in terms of like, especially if you cross, if you happen to cross state lines, it, it, it becomes a little bit of a different discussion too. So nonetheless, a really, really interesting, you know, case. It could have gone either way. Um, thankfully, it went well, but prompted a lot of discussions, a lot of, you know, really prompted a decision-making sort of tree to bring kids directly to the OR. We've transported now at least 15 children um, since, um, and they all did great. Um, it's, it's very, it's very tricky. So, and we're very thankful that we're, you know, every time you're put in this, this in this situation, um, the outcomes could be, um, you know, a variety, you could have a variety of outcomes. So it's never easy. I, you know, I just like to say, I, I get the, you know, the bad airway is better than no airway. I think the other thing we had to recognize what in why I think this is a good decision ultimately to go to the OR is all of the treatments that were being done it seemed like the kid was still getting worse. 
right? So if, if the kid was sort of maintaining or there was a little bit of improvement or we were resuscitating to a point where we had some time, that's a different story. But it would be hard to sort of rationalize that we're doing X, Y, Z and the patient is still getting worse. So then we're gonna put him in a transport and we're gonna transport him for 40 minutes. Um, and I thought the airway plan was, was very appropriate. Um, you know, as Karina said, the, the one big thing you have to worry about is certainly secretions. The kid obviously had secretions to start with. They're going to increase, potentially increase secretions with the ketamine, but being prepared for that, again, I, I, I think as long as you're, you know, that's an option, uh, you could be able to plan for it. So kudos to the team there. They did a great job. And, and for you guys, the entire PICU team for, for working through this very difficult case and really going systematically through all the various options. I think ultimately that was the key to the good outcome. Uh, that all of the options were discussed, were thought about, were planned for, and, and this was the ultimate decision. And, you know, yeah, you know, we're, we're looking in hindsight, but I, I, I think this was, was the right way to go. Awesome. Thank you, Ace. I fully agree. This is exactly what made the difference for us, too. The fact that the kid was um, getting worse instead of at least remaining stable. Um, and it seemed that sort of they were doing more and more interventions, non-invasive, all of them, but um, he was becoming sort of more lethargic, more tired, more desaturated, more tachycardic. Um, so um, being able to pick up on those and ultimately decide, um, I fully agree with you. All right, so we're gonna move on to our second case, I think. This one is nowhere near as interesting. It really isn't specific to pediatrics as much as this airway case was, but I, we found it to be an interesting case, so I thought we would present it here. So case two is a cardiac arrest. You're, you're sitting down eating lunch and your pager goes off for a 15-year-old witness cardiac arrest in the field, transported to a referring hospital about 18 miles away. So what is everybody's thoughts? 15-year-old cardiac arrest. Well, obviously the diagnosis is cardiac arrest, um, but what goes through your mind about um, potential etiologies and um, you know, what do you have to offer back here at Hopkins? Are you gonna stay at the other hospital until ROSC is achieved? Um, is this child and ECMO candidate as a witness rest? And I'm going to stop talking there. I'll go. For, for me, the witness part is key because for our protocol here, this 15-year-old witness cardiac arrest, I'm assuming it's witnessed by a healthcare professional by 911, would be an ECMO candidate for us. So for me, it would be to get the child back here ASAP for ECMO if we can't achieve us. Anybody else? Nobody? Dr. Yeah, just lots, just lots of questions about what was going on when the arrest happened. Yeah, they were um, shopping at the ball. She's buying a new dress for the prom. So like just sudden, basically, no, no precipitating factors, nothing like that. Correct. I mean, shopping for a prom dress is a precipitating factor, <laughs> one might have, but well, maybe not for a cardiac arrest. Women can't make decisions <laughs> easily, okay? <laughs> You know, the, the ECMO thing is kind of curious here because, um, you know, if you're still located that far away, it's going to be very difficult to make that sort of transport in any degree of time to make these patients viable. But in terms of considerations, you know, once we get into that adolescent world, I think uh, Chad had mentioned there are toxidromes. There are certainly cardiac issues with, you know, channelopathies or maybe congenital long QT or something like that, which would affect your therapies. Respiratory always comes to mind in pediatric cases, but less likely to be the case here, given the 15-year-old. The right. um, I, I think when we talk about the preparation, because cardiac arrest, ironically, right, everybody is uh, afraid about pediatrics, and rightly so, but somehow cardiac arrest seems to be a little bit more familiar because it's so protocolized, but things like bringing your um, Lucas device 
and then considering any other possible etiologies. Like for example, if this was a massive PE, um, you may have to have other therapies and route to kind of preserve life until you can kind of make that other decision. Like for example, if there's a prostaglandin that's inhaled or something like that. So kind of keeping a broad based differential because it's unlikely to be accelerated cardiovascular disease going with a cath lab in a 15 year old. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we, do, we tr definitely trained for eCPR and this hospital would have been within our um, perimeter that we have set up. And we, you know, if we decide that it's an ECMO candidate and that's the first thing that comes out of our mouth, we hear cardiac arrest. We want enough information to be able to give to our attendees immediately in terms of, is this an eCPR candidate? Because then our algorithm, not for treatment necessarily looks different because we're still going to talk about our H's and our T's to, uh, you know, hopefully achieve ROSC, uh, but we will spend zero bedside time, zero. We will do all ALS and we will get back and be ready to cannulate immediately. So for us, when we hear cardiac arrest, we want to know whether it's witness. Now this child, and I'm going to get into a little more detail, um, was witnessed by her friends. So, you know, maybe not good, not good CPR was initiated. It wasn't in front of a hospital provider or in the back of an ambulance. And I'm going to let Karina talk, and I'm only giving her five minutes to talk a little bit about that and why we do it that way. And then we'll move on with the case. Go ahead, Karina. Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit specific to our team, um, although um, the National um, Pediatric Transport um, um, World um, is uh, having some experience with these um, transports as well. So the survey that we did a few years back, um, now it's about six years back, about 30% of the pediatric transport teams in the country were transporting for um, um, patients in cardiac arrest for potential um, eCPR candidation. And so it's certainly not, um, it's rare and, and the, the volume is, is low as one might um, imagine, but it's certainly not unheard of. Um, so we have protocolized it um, to such extent that we would try to, um, you know, as Phil mentioned, prioritize time and excellent CPR delivery um, and um, um, mentally um, sort of decouple um, a lot of the PALS, um, complex PALS algorithms um, from this, from the decision to um, just expeditiously transport to Hopkins. Um, in an effort um, to not compromise quality of CPR. Of course, this is a patient that nowadays would be um, able to be managed on a Lucas device. And at the time of the transport, that was not the case. We have certainly done a couple of these transports for patients and we've had um, some um, saves um, from, from this um, pro program that puts them on ECMO. Um, but certainly uh, what we have learned is that um, a, down, a total downtime time of, um, that exceeds two hours is universally uh, fatal unless you're cold. Um, um, so hypothermia um, is a different story. Um, but for normal thermic um, children, um, if you can't get them on, onto ECMO uh, within two hours, um, um, they, they tend to have unfavorable outcomes. So that's why um, location um, is important. Um, whether it was witnessed or not in the sense of, you know, having um, the, being able to access some um, high quality CPR immediately. So that's why I feel sort of mentioned, you know, just because it's witnessed, uh, it's also important to find out by whom. Um, and then uh, whether CPR, um, high quality CPR was initiated and maintained throughout. So those would be some of the criteria that we use. We have an entire algorithm. We have actually published it in PCCM for anyone uh, who wants to look at it. We've also published a survey. We've also published the, um, the work we've done, the five-year um, simulation work we've done, um, trying to um, achieve and maintain high quality manual CPR for patients who would not be candidates for a mechanical CPR device. Um, in transport, in transports as long as 20 to 30 minutes. 
uh, which is what we have um, decided would be our cutoff to realistically achieve a, two, a max of two hours um, downtime um, till cannulation. Um, so, so I can talk a lot about this, but this is, so just like um, upper airway obstruction is linked in our minds to difficult airway, cardiac arrest is linked in our minds to uh, transport for potentially CPR. And that is just so that um, we start the ball rolling at minute zero, as opposed to thinking about it five minutes into it, and then another five minutes, another five minutes. By the time you've talked about it, uh, the patient is outside of the window. Um, so, but I'll, I'll let Phil, um, this is yeah, actually I'll, I'll go on. Yeah, I'll go on with the case. Um, yeah. But, you know, for us, you know, if the child is not an ECMO candidate, we probably wouldn't head back to the hospital until we could achieve some ROSC, right? Because then what would we be offering here at this institution, basically, unless, you know, there is a reversible situation. So this is a 15-year-old witness cardiac arrest at the mall with her friends. EMS was called. She was pulseless on EMS arrival. Uh, they started CPR, not her friend, and an AED was placed. The AED recommended shock. The uh, V-fib on the EKG was noted, and amniodarin was given, and they did achieve ROSC, uh, but the patient was now in complete heart block, so they initiated pacing. This is the EMS's uh, EKG. So it looks like VFib, and then they shocked, and you can see a complex starting over to the right. So they were pacing her externally, obviously, and during transition from, e from the EMS defibrillator, uh, she went into a PEA arrest. She got epi twice, um, and the rhythm revolved to the fib. She was shocked again, and they received ROSC, achieved ROSC. So at that point, she was being paced at a rate of 100. Her blood pressure was 75 over 48, uh, and she they were achieving end titles of about 25. She had delayed cap refill, cool extremities, she was intubated, uh, sedated, and paralyzed, and they were doing some imaging, and she was started on an amiodarone drip. And that's about when our team arrived. Uh, they hadn't gotten anything back yet in terms of her x-rays, and they were, you know, her mother hadn't arrived at the hospital yet. So here's her chest x-ray. Anybody want to comment on that? CNET tube. Anybody? And this, this like truly happened. This x ray came up, and uh, this is what we saw. That no part problem. is about as big as your helicopter. Ace. Huge. Huge. I was, I was gonna say I'm not really good at reading chest X-rays, but that heart oh. looks really big. Huge. Okay. Do you like where your ET tube is? I can't see the carina. Um, okay. What else do you guys see? I see two things that you have nobody's mentioned. She's got sternal wires. Oh, yeah. she's got sternal yeah. wires. So what does that mean to you? I mean, somebody was dicking around in her chest. Okay, so she's had some sort of cardiac surgery. Anything else you see? I see one more thing. All right, nobody? I'm going to give you the belly and then I'll, it's- I'll bite. bite. Yeah, oh, go ahead. You said it. Go ahead. You know, you bite. Uh, the hemidiaphragm. Oh, I don't know if it's, just, if it's just the way I'm looking at it on the screen here, but uh, it could just be her heart, but something's going on in her abdomen too. I don't know what is going on. All right, well, let me her, show you- The hemidiaphragm looks really elevated. Let me show you what's going on in her abdomen. Mm. What's that? Well, she had wires going there. Yeah. <laughs> that's what. Yeah. That's what she so had. So you can see it in her chest x-ray, right? You can see the wires in her chest x-ray. So then we were like, oh, no. <laughs> Not only has she had cardiac surgery, but she's had a face, sir. 
See, it does pay off to take x-rays sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Everybody laughs at us. Like, what do you guys want so many x-rays for? Well, you, mm. you know, the interesting thing was the, the post-arrest rhythm. Like, going into a third-degree yeah. heart block was very curious. Yeah, like, yeah. That, was, yeah. that initially was like, hmm, there's mm. something strange going on. And that initial sort of post-ROSC rhythm, I think, can be very, very telling for an underlying ideology. And if we didn't have this, does she have other some other like undiagnosed, um, you know, ARVD something that, you know, caused her to have conduction abnormalities more so than just precipitated, you know, a VF? Yeah, yep. Asa, this is fantastic. I was going to ask the adult colleagues because, you know, VF is not a pediatric rhythm, right? Uh, we, we know PA, we know, like, but V, Brady, you know, um, um, Brady PA, we know, you know, obviously like a systole, unfortunately, but, but B, you know, the shockable rhythms are generally not pediatric rhythms. So they make us always think of one of two things, one, a toxidrome and two, a cardiac problem. Like you don't think of anything else. Well, you know, you can, if you want to be very academic, but you know, like in, in the heat of the moment, that's sort of what you're thinking of. So how often do you see sort of this, you know, block after you defibrillate somebody and that is this really telling um of uh, of an, uh, an underlying problem i mean i'm just gonna let you guys talk because i for us it was interesting well i the first thing is you know we always talk about doing no harm and sometimes we can complicate stuff i mean the only time you're going to see stuff like that is with you know diseased heart and known conduction delays and one of the things that's very curious is and, and we've learned this you know it, <laughs> Again, I, I like to try to look at physiology and, and not so much adult versus pediatric, but this idea of initiating people on an amiodarone infusion, these antidysrhythmics are quite um, harmful. And unless you have like VT storm or some compelling indication, all of our antidysrhythmics are prorhythmic. And I, I think in the past couple of years, this has really changed my practice. The worst thing you could do is suppress um, these things and you got to look at the um, underlying cause because amiodarone is certainly has negative inotropic um, properties. It's a sodium channel blocker, a calcium channel blocker, a potassium channel blocker. So I think there's a potential to make these things worse with just reflexive initiation of antidysrhythmics. I would much more err on the side of, you know, giving magnesium and holding things out, getting a 12 lead before you'd start more medicines like this, especially given this particular, this x-ray in this presentation. So not so common at all. So it was not. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that the amiodarone was started sort of per, per usual PALS protocol before they even sort of saw these x-rays because the x-rays appeared when our team, like everybody saw the x-rays at the same time. Um, but it has been a little bit of a change in our practice as well that um, we sort of tend to think a little bit twice about amio in particular, um, certainly magnesium, sometimes lidocaine seems to be a little bit um, more benign um, um, in terms of um, uh, side effect profile for us. Um, but, uh, but it's interesting. I was actually thinking just more of the, in terms of like what Asa mentioned, like how often do you defibrillate someone for a strict, you know, clearly defib, you know, rhythm, and then you see a block. Um, like that, you just, you know, so I just wanted to see like how, how off, what's, what's your um, sort of perspective? Uh, for us, this is a very rare occurrence. Like VF arrests in, in pediatric age groups are very rare um, compared to, you know, your volumes. So that's why I was asked. I, I, I think if I saw, you know, if I saw this post ROSC, VF, third degree heart block, I would typically think of something still ischemic in origin, right, as a VF etiology that, you know, has affected the conduction pathway beyond the AV node. Um, so is there some inferior STEMI RCA uh, lesion that was really underlying this? Um, and again, you know, I, I would still ideally push cardiology in the adult world, right, interventional to potentially take this patient up to the lab and take a look. Um, you know, third degree heart block could be seen in obviously toxidromes as well, but, you know, the primary presenting rhythm of VF would be much less likely for that. So my first thought would be some ischemic mediated lesion that is beyond the AV node that is causing the patient to be in third degree heart block. Or, yeah, or what ended up being in this case, a patient did have, you know, a, a third degree heart block and had a pacer for that. 
but who would have thought of that um, right. you know possibility uh, at the time um, certainly now now we know it and we talk about it but this would have really not been uh, on my differential especially as I'm not a cardiac intensivist so um, really interesting All right, so what did we do? Well, not, not, not a whole lot, actually. We uh, continued to pace, or the child was being paced, um, was obviously post-arrest with poor perfusion, did have palpable pulses, was intubated on a vent, uh, was being chemically paralyzed, did have a uh, pupillary response at that point, and, um, that was her lab. Phil, do you know why the patient was paralyzed, actually? You know what? I don't know why, actually. Um, now that I think of it. I have her, I have her chart in front of me. But yeah, I, that's okay. Don't derail. I thought maybe you knew. Because it's certainly yeah, not yeah. something that's common for us to have a paralyzed. Um, I mean, they would get into yeah. 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 I, Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we did it, but I think we just continued it. Uh, okay. so I think, you know, the biggest concern from a transport status from us or was that, you know, we didn't want to disrupt this pace, you know, the external pacing when we transitioned to our monitor, um, even for a second, because then she just always seemed to arrest and she, and, and, and so what we did was we, you know, we put our own pads on and then um, hooked her up to our monitor as well as she was on theirs being paced. And then we started to um, turn up our MA and turn down their MA until we got capture. And then we basically took over uh, the pacing at that point. Do you wanna talk about deactivating um, the um, internal pacemaker? Yeah, so they, what, what, what we were noticing when we put her on our monitor and then we're trying to transition her without like disrupting pacing altogether was that we were seeing intermittent uh, pacer spikes that were interfering with our ability to externally pace her. And so we ran out to the truck, got the old magnet, <laughs> put the magnet on her pacer and taped it down so that, that her... Um, her pacer wouldn't be tried to fire even at um, whatever rate it was attempting to fire at. And the really sad part about this whole situation for this child is that um, she ended up having um, cardiac surgery for double outlet right ventricle pulmonary stenosis as a, as a child, a baby. And when she was about seven or eight years old, her mother died and nobody in the family um, decided that they were going to uh, take custody. So the mother's best friend did. And the mother's best friend knew of her history of having this cardiac surgery, maybe not as, you know, as much as she should have. Um, but anyway, this, she was eventually lost to follow up. And the last time that these uh, foster mother slash adopted mom mm -hmm. took her for a cardiac visit was three years um, before this episode. And so basically the pacer battery just died. And that was the etiology of her arrest. Can, well, can, we, call, can we go back and sort of talk to the group, get their experience since I'm, um, this is again, not a very um, common um, pediatric transport for us. I'm imagining maybe you would see more pacemakers and failed pacemakers in the adult uh, world. Um, yeah, so we certainly didn't expect, can you go back to the slide, um, the, to the prior slide, would you be able to? Yeah. We, cert we certainly didn't, um, didn't expect to have so much trouble trying to, to transition her from um, the referring hospitals, um, Pacer um, to our um, um, pacer, um, and of, of course the magnet. Initially, um, she was probably still having low output, low cardiac output, um, 
um, as evidenced by her suboptimal blood pressure. Um, and then I think uh, folks worked um, on her um, a bit and then um, kept increasing the MAs. And I think that she ultimately um, achieved the best blood pressure um, with her own um, pacer deactivated and um, MAs into the you know 110 to 140s. Um, she got a little bit of a better blood pressure, like 90s over 60s. Um, and then there was quite a bit of um, sort of effort to try to um, get her onto our pads and our pacemaker without causing her to arrest. Um, so then they you know they placed the uh, pads you know in various positions. Um, ultimately, they used this, met this method of having her on two pads at the same time and then gradually decreasing the MAs on the referring um, hospital um, um, pacer and increasing the MAs um, on ours so that she sort of, you know, doesn't see um, the difference. And that, that um, worked. Um, but when we debriefed this case, um, folks had all sorts of other ideas about how else we could have done this. Um, you know, could we have just transported her on the referring hospitals pad? Could we, and we didn't because it wasn't the same technology and we didn't have the same monitors. And so it ended up like not, that not being a sort of a viable solution. Um, but I'm wondering, um, where's the wisdom from your groups? Um, what do you guys do in these scenarios? I have a few thoughts, but I'll open up to the rest of my group first. <laughs> And then I'll <laughs> chime in. Either Kate, Ruben, Eric, any of you guys, Matt, Ruben. Um, I'll, just, I'll just say that uh, it's not that uncommon to remember that same situation where you have different technology or model monitor um, from like an EMS service to a hospital service. And so this is usually kind of a not that uncommon sort of phenomenon of like having multiple sets of pacer pads on a patient and then transitioning off of one monitor or pacer device onto the other. Uh, and so um, this is kind of a similar sort of procedure that uh, you know, we tend to use at, at Howard County, for example. The uh, EMS crews use a pre-hospital monitor that's like PAC-15 and then the hospital uses all monitor. And so we, we, this is sort of a scenario that um, we train on and sort of uh, practice to try and smoothly transition from one set of pacing devices to the other. Uh, so it's actually not particularly uncommon. It, it's, it's kind of nice, actually, if you happen to run into a crew or a service where you are using the same, uh, same set of technology, you can just like switch the devices over from one to the other without removing the pads. But um, unfortunately, this is sort of a common sort of thing. Uh, but as far as like the pacer devices, like end of battery life thing, um, yeah, I think this is kind of a unique situation. I, I mean, it happens sometimes, but uh, I think generally in the adult population, you know, there's a little bit more, uh, I don't know, I've probably only seen it maybe maybe less than three times where, you know, there's actually like failure of the pacer itself due to the battery running out. Um, typically, you know, at least in the patients that I've seen, you know, there's there's been some sort of follow-up where, you know, cardiologists are involved and if they have a plan to, Kind of replace the pacer box or put a new battery in. Um, that uh, not something that I definitely would have thought of in a fifteen-year-old uh, for sure. Depending on you know how old she was when they placed this pacer device in the first you know um, initially right in her abdomen. Um, but then I'll turn it back over to uh, Dr. Lawn or Dr. Margolis or anybody else. Yeah, I, I like the, uh, so in the chat, there's a lot, a lot of good discussion about transcutaneous pacing. I mean, just to broaden the discussion here, it's interesting because the magnet should turn it into kind of an asynchronous mode, which is much more familiar to all of us because it's kind of a uh, transcutaneous pacing um, attempt. And I think Lee Case has talked about a very good way to kind of transition that because you obviously don't want to lose it. And in this case, it seems that um, to Kate's point, the pacer is not working, whether that's end of life or, or malfunction. So I completely agree with the transition and titrating up rapidly. <clears throat> the other thing to consider in cases like this, although it's much more common in the adult patients, is when you can't get pacing capture, you worry about <clears throat> electrolytes. So that's something to consider as well. Agreed. Um, agree with everything that's been said with respect to the pacing. Yeah. 
um, and the electrolyte obviously issue. The other thing I keep in my back pocket, if for some reason we, we can't get capture and we're trying all this type of stuff and it's really a obviously a bradycardia mediated event. And in this case, we're not that worried about ischemia is like isoproternal. So do like a pharmacologically mediated pacing. Um, and you could start the patient isopril and titrate up the isopril. The problem, you know, the downside to isopril is obviously, you know, the beta effects can uh, exacerbate an ischemically mediated problem, but that's not what's going on here. So that is another sort of option I think we can, you know, think about if for whatever reason, uh, all of these sort of troubleshooting mechanisms didn't end up working. I'm glad you didn't mention the placement of the transvenous pacer at the outside hospital on the 15 year old, you know, that was a, a whole different discussion, but you know, to your point, Craig, we do, we, we do see this in these patients I and mean, we have such train wrecks and, and, you know, the, as they get older, um, this is a skill that is within the subset of some emergency physicians, but certainly outside of the box for this 15 year old. I, I totally agree with the medical management and you'll notice there are some really good attention to hemodynamics here. So the fact that the patient is somewhat resuscitated and doing well with the maybe uh, some fluids, hemodynamic management and titrating up the pacer amperes, I think they did a very good job with um, temporizing this patient to the best extent possible. Still waiting to hear what happened with the amiodarone drip. Do we finally get that off there or what? No, I think I'm ashamed to say. I'm, yeah, she got she got all the way to Hopkins with it. <laughs> I, I think that she... because she was get her hemodynamics were getting uh, better, so I think that it would have certainly been a um, a discussion point if she were to um, sort of look worse and become more hypotensive and. In, in terms of like, you know, what, what actually works and what kind of um, is a little bit counterproductive. Um, but it seemed like with a um, little bit of fluid and certainly increasing the MAs, her hemodynamics um, um, plumped up a little bit. So I think that folks were um, reluctant to take away things um, empirically. But um, yeah, it's a good Phil, you had capture on the pacer that was at the sending facility? They did, yeah. Yeah. So the other thing, and I've I've not done this trans with a transcutaneous pacer, but we've done this with transvenous pacers, is we just take their pacer, and we tell them we'll bring it back to them. And it's a little harder with taking the uh, defibrillator off top top of somebody's crash cart. You have to ask a little nicer and be a little more convincing. But at that point, I think I would have just snatched their crash cart, their pacer up, and just taken it with me. Take their um, take their defibrillator. That's another option that I've done with a transvenous pacer before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can't remember, Karina, why the, the discussion was with the team, because this was a couple of years ago, why they decided to do to put her on our monitor. Do you remember, Karina? They didn't. So they they told me that, I, again, I can't remember the specifics, but um, I do remember we discussed it uh, as mm -hmm. sort of the easiest choice for me. I'm like, well, just take what works. Um, I mean, initially, in my opinion, a blood pressure of 70 over 30 means it doesn't work. But once they deactivated, once they use the magnet and deactivated and then increase the MAs, like with those little things, a little bit of volume, stuff like that, it did get better. So then it became the problem, like, how, now how do you switch it? Um, so I had said, well, why didn't you take it? And they said, no, it was not the same. Um, it was not the same um, technology. Um, and I can't remember if they said they didn't know how to fully work the, um, yeah. the equipment and they didn't feel comfortable sort of taking a piece of equipment that, um, A, was not there, B, they didn't quite know how to work it and, you know, C, you know, I don't know if it's rated for transport or not. Um, so it's not, uh, it wasn't one of our hospitals or sister hospitals, and I cannot remember for the life of me what um, type of equipment it was, but that was the reason behind not doing it. Because it did seem like the most sort of straightforward choice of just like taking what works. Um, so that that's what prompted them to try um, to uh, uh, find a different way of actually getting her onto our um, equipment. And I don't know if it hadn't been, if they hadn't been able to do it in any way, shape or form for some reason, then sort of what would the choice be uh, or what would her choice have been? I, I, I don't know whether at that point they would have said, fine, you know, let's take it. That people uh, on, the, on the initial call when we debriefed it, commented on like, well, yeah, maybe you can take, you know, a nurse from that hospital that knows how to, or someone that knows how to operate the equipment 
Um, and then, so that you're, you're talking about really creative solutions here, which we've all done, um, but of course, um, you know, there are a lot of medical legal kind of implications in just kind of snatching somebody's personnel, going into an ambulance, God forbid you get into an accident. Like you can envision all sorts of bad stuff happening. So you don't want to go there, but, but in terms of like um, creative solutions, certainly they would have, um, people were offering them on the, on the initial debriefing years back. This was years back. So, yeah. Yep. So I think that's all I have. I, I can't see what's in the chat if we've answered all the questions. Sam? Yep. Yeah, no, everything looks good. I appreciate everybody's time. This was, I think this was really great. I, I, uh, I hope everybody got something out of, out of these PEDS cases. Um, I was really excited to have, uh, have the PEDS team on to talk about some of this stuff because I, this is very much out of our comfort zone as uh, the generalist adult teams. Um, <clears throat> so I, I hope we got something out of this. I, I thank everybody for being on. Um, if anybody has any last minute questions, please throw them in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and ask. We got about another five minutes left. Um, but if nobody's got anything, then uh, we'll shut it down. I have a quick Thank you, question. Pete's team. Karina, awesome to see you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Ruben, what you got? Go ahead. I have a quick question. When you guys train your fellows and doing like your awake intubations, what do you guys do for anesthetizing the airway? Because when I've tried doing it in ketamine, sometimes it works great. Every now and then I get in trouble with, you know, they they cough or the ketamine doesn't have them totally dissociated. So do you guys anesthetize the airway? Meaning with lidocaine is what you're asking. If we do lidocaine. Um, yeah, however you guys do. Yeah, um, we actually, we don't do a whole lot of um, um, awake intubations. Um, for, for, for children, I think that for older patients, um, certainly the pediatric anesthesiologists have, have done them and for peds, you have to get them, you have to get them deep somehow. Um, so, um, choosing ketamine as an anesthetic that will, um, will give, um, you know, a good amount of, um, dissociative anesthesia, I think that, or analgesia is, is, is it's, it has never not worked for us. It's just a matter of being able to titrate it. Um, so um, we would, you know, we would use a tit titratable induction um, with just, you know, um, either it depends on like how how altered the child is um, and what the hemodynamics look like. Of course, the hemodynamic profile of ketamine is pretty decent unless you're in a um, um, catechol deplete state, in which case you will go straight to ECMO. We've certainly done that um, or seen that, um, you know, even last week with a patient that came from transport, um, but hopefully that won't be the case. It's a very rare instance. Um, so hemodynamic issues are not there um, and they do spontaneously breathe even with a lot of ketamine on board. Um, so, you know, we give, you know, one per kilo, one per kilo, one per kilo, you, you give enough increments of one per kilo until they're deep enough. Um, you know, you can give a, a little bit of benzo if you have really no worries, um, about the, about the airway. But other than that, um, it's pretty much having a lot of ketamine on board and then having an agent available, um, for, um, for the secretions. So something like atropine, and if you're worried that atropine is gonna take away your pupillary exam for long enough, and you need the pupillary exam for something, um, you know, glyco um, is a little bit of a friendlier drug. Um, so that's what we do, um, you know, usually glyco and, um, um, and ketamine in titratable doses. And then people use whatever increments they want. Some use 0.5 per kilo increments, some use two, one per kilo increments, some use two per kilo increments. It sort of all depends on, on how sort of feisty the kid is, um, how much um, sort of drugs have they seen, some have seen, some have not. Um, and, you know, what, what, are, what else is happening from a hemodynamic standpoint? The more typical one would be one per kilo increments. And you have like four one per kilo increments drawn up and then you just administer. Um, 
and that's if you're if you're, if the coughing is what's going to make you um, not be able to secure your airway in the end. But you're that's why people also draw up a dose of paralytics, but they will never administer the dose of paralytic until unless they are um, absolutely confident that they can back mass ventilate the patient. And are you teaching your fellows like specific exam maneuvers to check if they're deep enough before they go into the airway? Or are you just looking for like nystagmus? Or what are you guys looking for? What do you guys teach the fellows? With the ketamine? I mean, you will see that, but um, I mean, normally they would, you would see the same, are you specifically, I'm not quite sure of, of the question. Are you specifically asking about the ketamine and, itself or? In terms of when they're deep enough, because it, when I've tried it in the past, they, you know, certain, I'm thinking of like two cases where you know they look dissociated, they have some exam features, and then you go into the airway. Yeah, we can't quite hear you. Ruben, is it just me that I can't hear? Ruben, we lost your audio. Yeah, we lost the audio. I think what he's trying to say is that they seem um, dissociated, but they were really not deep enough. And I think that if they, if you're trying to DL and then you're seeing some sort of cough or something, you can always go give more. Um, so it's not, you know, you're bagging them. You're able to see that you're getting entitled. You're able to see that they're sinking with your bag, that they're easy to bag. Um, so you can, you can always give more. I, I wouldn't be able to sort of give you a prescription for exactly how many doses of ketamine. Um, because that varies, you know, widely with, with a, you know, child. Um, um, but, uh, if you're worried, you're not deep enough. That's the beauty of the titration. You just give more. Give, oh, there great. is no Thank problem you. with your hemodynamics. Yeah. I would have, I usually, we usually have four, at least four doses of one per kilo already drawn up. And then you just give, and if it's IM, you need to double it, but there is that for peace. But for IVs, you know, I hope that answered. <laughs> but um, uh, thank you, everyone, and it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure being here and, and talking to the group and sort of hearing your thoughts. We've also learned quite quite a bit. Um, and then uh, Asa, it was a pleasure talking to you. Other than um, um, you know, I usually call you with problems with my family. <laughs> so, Always good to hear from you. Outside of personal emergencies, this was wonderful to see you again. <laughs> Always good to hear from you. Hey, Asa, Thanks, this, everyone. Thanks for hey, joining. Asa, this is Bruce. Uh, yeah. is, the P, is the PEDS team routinely invited to this quarterly meeting? If not, invite us. Yes, we will do. Sam, put it on the list. Done. It was our there first invite. There's always a first, right? I told you about that during our quarterly quarterly meetings. We've collaborated. That's not ben, fair. Ben told us. I, I mean, that. he did. He did. I got the formal well, invite. Separation. I feel like Pusha gets. You I heard feel it like here Pusha first. gets the Pusha gets the invite because she. Yeah, don't throw me under the bus. <laughs> Pusha gets the invite because she was the one that came up with the idea of having you guys on. Uh, Pusha. Uh, I'm just saying. Sam, you're throwing me under. Who's your trained me? Us. Yeah. <laughs> I did. Yes. See, how, see how slick they are? Do you see that? They're like quick to, you know, quick on their feet. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're happy to, one of us could be, could be here that, um, yeah. yeah, man, it's, it's, yeah. It's we'll tough. absolutely I'm, get I'm you guys looped in on the invite for this. I, I think it's going to be an ongoing, ongoing thing. So. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm excited for this to, to continue on. We, we had a good year last year and we were, we'll post this stuff to, um, it usually goes up on YouTube and then the link goes out to everybody to, to be able to share with their respective teams. So, all right, well, I'm going to, I'm going to kill the, the broadcast here. I, I appreciate everybody being on and, uh, thanks for joining. Thanks guys. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.